Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Manic Mondays. It's time to continue 2004. The time machine is stuck, which means it's time for WWE Vengeance. I've got vengeance on my mind. I've certainly got some vengeance after watching the last two fucking car crashes. I am your host, Amir's name, and joining me to discuss vengeance is Steve Neal. Yeah, baby. Two weeks after the absolute fetal anomaly that was the Great American Bash, WWE served up Vengeance, uh, which was a raw pay-per-view after the absolute fucking horrendous SmackDown pay-per-view. And what this card did was illustrate very clearly what the A-show was in the mind of Vincent K. McMahon. Fuck you, the SmackDown. Fuck you, Blue Brand. All of the stars for Raw. Uh, so, yes, this was in pretty much the home, really, of WWE as well, isn't it? Hartford, Connecticut. Triple H has grown up around the corner. We all lick each other here. Mm. Taste that sweet McMahon pudding. I've got this wonderful uh, image in my head of like the the promo guy who goes, and now, sponsored by Sour Skittles, WWE presents Fetal Anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Snitsky the- in the main event versus Kane. It's Snitsky <laughs> all over again. Is that, any be- <laughs> Is that any worse than fucking Great Balls of Fire, really? Leave if we're Great being Balls honest. of Fire alone. I loved Great Balls. Of- like, that great pay-per-view, pay-per-view ended up being shit fucking now. great because yeah. Of the name. Great it lived up to name. its name. Oh, I love great balls. <laughs> this gracious WWE Vengeance 2004. Um, yeah, I was a little bit alarmed when I saw this pay per view opening with Jonathan fucking Coachman and Garrison Cade <sighs> versus mm. the ECW connection, Tadgers and his mystery partner, Rhino. And nobody gives a shit. What an opener, sir. Yeah. One for the ages, this. Um, we've already, after what we saw with Great American Bash, you think, okay, but at least Raw, you know, Raw's got some stars and we're going to be getting a much higher calibre of show. And when it opened with this, fuck you! Fuck you, Vince McMahon! <laughs> Literally, I want to punt Bischoff in the scrotum at this point. Absolute bellend. Um, shit match. And again... For Jonathan Coachman seems to be having matches that are far too long. Seven and a half minutes on pay-per-view for Jonathan Coachman. And this is similar to what he's had at each of the last what, three raw pay-per-views he's been wrestling on for seven or eight or ten minutes. It's mental. Uh, but at least this time, Rhino and Tadgers go over rather than fucking Coachman. Uh, just, yeah absolutely awful a steaming shit of a match what pisses me off the only note i have from this match other than the fact that i was infuriated at the idea of jonathan coachman getting offense in again is the fact that if you listen carefully at the beginning of the match while the commentators are bickering which they do a lot jr mm. jerry lord on this they say that uh to jerry oh if you might remember to jerry beat jonathan coachman at backlash he fucking didn't <laughs> he jonathan did not coachman beat him you stupid fucking idiots like Oh, just... Oh, yeah, nobody cares about that. That only happened, what, three, four months ago? <laughs> it didn't happen, mate. Shut your face. So fucking stupid. The revisionist history... Of, oh, you don't remember. You're all a bunch of dumb shits. You just pay money to watch Coach. Fuck you. Like, just a massive slap in the face of any fan that watches this and takes any kind of passion or interest in the longevity of storylines. What a fucking rinser. Uh, I gave it two out of five because... Tadgers won, and I like Tadgers, and Tadgers <laughs> deserves two. Um, but everyone else can go fuck themselves. I didn't think Rhino actually was even that bad. Garrison K just puts in a shift. Um, the one note I did yeah. as well was that Jonathan Coachman takes a fairly decent suplex for a guy who can't wrestle, actually. He took the bump very nicely, I thought. For textbook, sir. Well done. Um, Time for a retard bashing session. I uh, in no way endorse the use of that word, but WWE does because Evolution's backstage with Eugene. Um, Evolution wants an explanation as to why Eugene is part of it. Also, I love Ric Flair saying, you're killing our gimmick. It's not a gimmick, Ric. Shut up. <laughs> you're killing our gimmick, bro. Real. <laughs> uh, don't work yourself into a shoot, brother. Uh, it's ridiculous. He's backstage, um, you know, trying to explain. My favorite thing is when he goes, 
where's Eugene? And Randy Orton goes, it's Dave's turn to watch him. <laughs> that was really funny. Uh, Eugene, of course, they find him sort of, well, Triple H eavesdrops on him in the corridor where Chris Benoit, in all of his charisma, musters up this miserable <laughs> backstage mm. promo where he tries to convince Eugene that, I'm your friend, Eugene. Evolution is just using you. Prove me wrong! Murder, murder, murder. <laughs> it's just the whole thing's just very greasy. It's, yeah, not good. It's not good at all. It's a terrible backstage segment. Also, I find it really jarring looking at Triple H with no beard and massive long hair. He just looks like Val Kilmer on roids. It's very unnecessary. He looks like a shit Val Venus, doesn't he? <laughs> shit Val Venus. He like looks a like a B-Tech. He looks like a B-Tech Lance Cole. And it does look like a B-Tech Lance Cole. He's just a, yeah, awful, against an awful unnecessary segment like I love the idea that Eugene's just wandering the halls and conveniently literally just outside the evolution locker room Benoit the opponent of the leader of evolution is just hanging around to find Eugene it's just the whole thing is set up so badly it's so it's such badly written and staged shit Mm. Uh, it's just bad tv it's bad it's supposed TV. to be a blood feud, isn't it? And he's sat, he's yeah. literally a yard from Triple H. And you know, like, Triple <laughs> H can hear him as well. Triple H it's hiding like, behind a door. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's because that's, that's fucking, the spins of a man. Fucking, he's got Batista, Randy Orton and Ric Flair in the other room. And he's like, you don't want to go outside and show that I'm here, guys? <laughs> <laughs> fucking bellend. The whole thing's done. That's just Vince McMahon just going, eavesdrop on him like I do the women. That's how it's done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just hide well, I do behind Molly Holly putting on her wig. Oh, no. It, yeah, it's just cringeworthy. Anyway, it's now time for Drax versus Le Champion. Batista versus Chris Jericho, uh, which on paper should have been quite good. However, Batista's still quite green at this point, mm. so it's a very bang average match. Uh, Jericho's still insisting on using this running in Zaguri. I have no idea why this is the case, whether WWE had thought that the moonsault was a little bit too dangerous. Maybe Trips was like, hmm, you gotta, you gotta lower down your offense so I look even better. <laughs> so I can just see it. Uh, the reign of terror that was currently going on at this point. But yeah, Jericho gets a, a half decent match out of Batista. You could definitely see improvement in Batista, especially since the Royal Rumble when they were tag mm. champions. Him and Ric Flair. Like he has definitely come along nicely. You can see a lot of growth in him, but he's still far from the finished article and the world champion that we would come to enjoy in 07, 08. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's he's getting there very slowly, but at this point he's still a bit of a roid monkey and Jericho puts in an admirable job. But even Jericho doesn't look overly infused. He almost looks a little bored at this point. And this is something I've noticed about Jericho because in the 2001 story art that we did, Jericho was pretty much the MVP. At mm. this point, he's putting on good matches, but there's really... I really get an indication that Chris Jericho is finding it hard to be motivated and that shows in his performances I think and this is another one where you thought it's good but it's just not the best that you would expect especially out of both guys Batista's green Jericho looks demotivated yeah that's literally the perfect word it it feels like I think when Benoit won the title at Mania I think there would have been a lot of guys who were you know and obviously Eddie had, had won the title at No Way Out there were a lot of smaller guys, and Chris Jericho would have been forefront among them, thinking, I'm going to you know, be in the title picture, I'm going to be in the main event picture, putting on these great matches with Benoit uh, for the title and showcasing brilliant wrestling at the top of the card. And that's obviously not what we get because of Triple H. Um, so I think Jericho probably is just starting to, at this point, feel you know, a bit frustrated by his position in the company because you know he went in there with fucking... Tonka truck in the last at the last pay per view because he's got more of a feud with Trish Stratus than he does with anyone else going on in the fucking roster, which goes back to WrestleMania before WrestleMania. You've got him and you know, he's kind of he had the thing with Christian at Mania and then again at Backlash and then he was on to Tyson Tomko and now he's kind of in there with Batista and the reasoning behind it was pretty weak for a pay-per-view match it was a match it was as you said it was fine but it felt like a match that probably should have been on a decent spot on raw rather than on a pay-per-view in terms of the quality that we got 
and you know where both guys maybe just were at this point in their career. Yeah, I um I must admit I kind of had to temper my expectations of it because when I first saw it I thought this could be awesome but a lot of people may not uh, remember it as well but for the world title these two would face each other three years down the line it was very famously the match where uh, Batista essentially went for the blade job and he ended up getting fined a hundred thousand dollars by Vince McMahon because <laughs> this was at a point where they uh, couldn't bleed anymore because of PG ratings coming in and he actually credits that as the moment where he lost his passion for wrestling you know he just sort of said like because they had to take the hit like Jericho and the referee I think got fined like 15 grand and boom he got 100 grand and he felt that you know that was just that was the final straw for him that was the camel that broke that was the straw that broke the camel's back he just said yeah I'm done with it and this obviously is not quite that match so it's just a building block and also, a really good advertisement for the fact that you might have big names, good-looking stars in your undercard, but if they don't click, you're not going to get the match that you want. And ultimately, this match is quite forgettable. It's only for me. It's only a two and a half out of five. Uh, yeah. Backstage again, Eugene backstage with Trips. Uh, Triple H basically manipulates him by saying he's not manipulating him, which is just ridiculous. And then Ric Flair throws a cop because Triple H gives him a rope. <laughs> <laughs> much to Ric Flair's chagrin. Uh, just one in a very long line of... Eugene is all over this pay-per-view. This is the pay-per-view of Eugene. So, as you can imagine, for people who are infuriated by the sheer nature of his gimmick, this is not a good time to be watching WWE. And I remember watching it back in the day. I was infuriated at 19. I'm especially infuriated at 35. Especially infuriated. And that leads nicely into our World Tag Team Championship match. La Resistance, which is now Robert, Conway, and Sylvain Grognier. Don't know what happened to Rene Dupree, but he did end up in SmackDown somewhere down the line. Um, against Ric Flair and Eugene. Uh, it's heel versus heel and tard. That's pretty much how they put this one together. Uh, that being said, I thought Ric Flair put in one head of a shift. But ultimately, this is another undercard match that leaves us a little bit wanting. Yeah, it was, this is one of the better matches that I've seen Eugene involved in. And that's because the guy who plays Eugene can work. There's no doubt that he's got ability in the ring. Obviously, he's not come into the wrestling business wanting to use this gimmick. Although the fact that he's carried on using it to this day uh, says, you know, not great things about his character. But... He works quite well. and Basically, he just has a match where he's imitating Ric Flair. That's basically the story of the match. He's imitating, you know, his hero and tag partner, Ric Flair. And, you know, he does like the strut and he does the fucking chops and the eye poke and all the classic Flairisms. Um, and, you know, Flair's just getting incensed. He's incredulous with rage incensed on the uh, on the mat because he feels like he's being mocked by this guy who's not fit to lace his boots and all this kind of stuff. And it's because of how Ric Flair sells it, it's actually mildly entertaining. And Eugene does actually quite a good job at doing the kind of the imitation from a wrestling standpoint. Um, that resistance, who are your tag champions, are complete props. They're irrelevant. It ends in a DQ. Uh, Ric Flair, I think, gets DQ'd. And obviously, La Resistance retain. But it's kind of just... They're your tag champions, and they're just chumps. They're just pointless. They're cannon fodder to this obsession that Vince McMahon has with the Eugene character. And obviously, you know, Ric Flair. Uh, it, it was okay from that point of view. There was an entertainment value in terms of what Eugene was doing, imitating Ric Flair and the way Rick was selling it. Um, but... Overall, the match, as an overall match, again, it feels like something that would be a relatively entertaining segment on Raw rather than something that should be 12 and a half minutes on pay-per-view. Uh, again, I don't know if that's me being an old-fashioned fuckwad. I 
I actually thought this was quite a decent match from a storyline perspective. The wrestling quantity is, is kind of irrelevant, but that's not what it's there for. It's not meant to be a great technical experience. What it is meant to do is show off a story. Like you mentioned, obviously, you know, Nick Dinsmore is a guy who plays Eugene. He'd been in WWE developmental for quite a while. He was kind of like Sean Spears was. This guy who had been in developmental for a long time, who was well-respected, but never really had an opportunity to prove himself on a superior level, you know, with the talent that obviously he wanted to be. And, you know, he... (sighs) This was basically his only opportunity to break through, which is why he probably initially took it. And like you say, the fact that he still runs with it today, he's been on Cold Commander's podcast in recent months as, you know, as the character and stuff. He uses this on the indies. You know, he's not ashamed of this fact. And I understand kind of why you would, because obviously you're well remembered for this gimmick if you turn up as Nick Dinsmore on the indies chances are you're not going to get a booking but at the same time it, like you say it speaks poorly to his character overall as an individual um, the match itself is fine I think once again Ric Flair surprises me at his older age you know putting in a good shift he had a good time with Sean Benjamin earlier in the year this was a decent match from his perspective like you say La Resistance absolutely pointless in every sense uh you know Rene Dupree for all the stick we give him had a little bit going for him he had a great look great body was quite funny as well for a heel and he was very good at being obnoxious so Von Grenier is utterly pointless like utterly he's got nothing going on other than that rehired by the WWE this week really Jesus he's he's gonna be a road agent I think that's astonishing. Like, he looks like a B Tech Joel Redman. Like he looks terrible. His singing is fucking atrocious. I know it's supposed to be like my my one of my favorite parts of this match actually is when he's trying to sing the Canadian national anthem, and I'm pretty sure he's not speaking French. I'm pretty sure he's just going. Um, at one point, Lenin Garcia just looks at him with a grotesque anger as if to say, "That is not singing. I hate you. You are ruining my credibility." Like he just looks so disgusted by the sheer sound coming out of his gob um, but yeah ultimately it's one of those matches where you think I fucking hate Eugene I fucking hate the gimmick but you can't discredit the amount of work that Nick Dinswell put into making the character as believable as possible that's not to say it's a good thing obviously but you know the one thing I will say from this match is that him and Ric Flair did a really admirable job of getting the story of what was given to them over whether it be cretinous or disgusting or not they actually delivered what they were supposed to do and I suppose that's probably going to earn you a lot of kudos backstage especially with management and you know, your peers. So fair play to him for that. It's a case of Flair puts in a fantastic shift, but I've still only given it two out of five from a wrestling standpoint. It's utterly pointless. And it's, uh, it's actually Eugene who gets disqualified. He accidentally pushes the ref over and, um, yeah, not that it really matters anyway, but yeah, no, I don't blame you. Um, but yeah, you could just see like Flair backstage. Going, I'm not jobbing to those two. Have Eugene get DQ. <laughs> you could just see it like no fucking chance right then from one horrendous angle to another we've had mental retardation now it's time for the baby rapers <laughs> it's time for kane it's time for Matt hardy dear god almighty the state of this fucking thing so um Lee has been busy. Uh, this is before the aforementioned heel turn when she got caught cheating with Edge. Uh, she's still with Matt Hardy for all intents and purposes. And, um, yeah, she's going to have a baby, but it turns out that it might be Kane. <laughs> so, Kane, uh, Lisa sleeps with Kane to essentially protect Matt Hardy um, because apparently Kane has always lusted after a child. Not in that way, of course, uh, but he's always wanted an offspring, somebody to continue on his demonic and evil legacy. And he has pinpointed Lita as the perfect woman to harbour said spouse. And this leads, of course, to a lovely no disqualification match. It's V1 versus Kane uh, for the honour of Lita, essentially. Um, there's also the wonderful line leading into this. It might be your which is <laughs> <She's> just classic <laughs> EastEnders in every sense. However, got to say, this is my favourite match of the entire card. These boys, uh, despite the hor- horrendous concept of this gimmick, delivered an excellent no disqualification matchup. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was uh, a really good match. I fucking hated the storyline around this. I completely hated it. Um, but the 
the match itself was was very good. You know, the Matt Hardy's always willing to take his share of lumps, always has been throughout his career. Um, I actually thought the V1 gimmick was was actually pretty good, pretty entertaining. Maybe some of the best stuff that the Matt Hardy you know did in WWE as a you know in terms of his singles career uh, it was probably the best stuff that he did. Um, and again, you know, Kane is always good in these kind of situations. Matt goes over, Lita's kind of involved, and then Matt kicks off afterwards because what if you'd got hurt? What if it hit you with those steps? You could have lost the baby, and it might be mine. Um, it's just Jerry Springer nonsense. And the thing is, people always harken back to either the Attitude Era or more and more as, you know, there's another generation of wrestling fans who are getting older and more tired of the current product, the Ruthless Aggression Era, oh, because that was the Attitude Era, big characters and crazy storylines, but with good wrestling uh, and, and good wrestlers as well, which you didn't have as much in the Attitude Era. Okay, well, that's fair enough. You sit there and criticise fucking the Lana, Bobby Lashley, Rusev, Liv Morgan crap that's going on in the current WWE product and talk about the Ruthless Aggression Era being so superior. And you've got Lita has been shagging Matt Hardy for a while. She was scared that Kane was going to really hurt Matt Hardy. So Kane said, I won't hurt Matt Hardy as long as you have sex with me, which is rape. So they've put out basically that Kane has forced Lita to have sex with him by threatening to murder her fiancé and has done so unprotected and pumped her full of his demon seed. And of course we know that that baby is is not going to, you know, get to the point of being born. Um because, you know, Lita is a miscarriage magnet at this point in the mind of Vince McMahon. The, honestly, the whole thing, when you actually break it down and look at it as it is, is fucking awful. It's so shit. It's proper Jerry Springer or EastEnders, like you said, and it is... It is, it is offensive. Like, you can't put out... So, uh, I like the idea that Matt Hardy's just waiting. Right, tell you what. I know he raped you. I'm not going to go after him now. I'm not going to call the police. What we're going to do is I'm going to have a no disqualification match with him. And if I pin him one, two, three in the middle of that ring, then basically it doesn't matter that he raped you, to be honest. That wipes out the crime because I won. So that's pretty sweet. What? What are you doing? Wrestling logic is amazing. Um, yeah, but the the match itself was very good. It, it delivered. And I agree, it probably was... It was definitely the most exciting match on the card because there was other there was good matches on the card, but they were all a bit ploddy and boring. Um, but this was yeah, this was exciting. Like we mentioned from the last match, it's fucking terrible in terms of a storyline. But the guys involved have gone out of their way to deliver a very credible and good story, and you know it's it's, it's difficult for me to sit here and really critique it like the match itself i actually think is fantastic from a no disqualification and story perspective uh there's a lot of what seems like genuine venom in there these are two guys who are just fantastic workers and this is what happens when you put two guys in the ring who can deliver all the time you know these guys always deliver they always had great matches overall okay not having necessarily a good year once again losing uh this time to um matt hardy he's getting chopped out all over the place when you actually think about it i think kane has lost every match on pay-per-view uh the brooklyn year, you know. brawler of 2004 he is like you know he got dumped out of the royal rumble obviously courtesy i think it's booker t um he lost to undertaker obviously at wrestlemania he lost to edge in that return match he's he lost to Benoit in a tire match and he loses here to Matt Hardy. And yet he still comes out looking credible. That's the really cool thing about his character at this time, even though it is incredibly rapey. And I just, yeah, the way you covered it. <laughs> well, I could get you done for rape, but instead I'm going to fight you. No disqualification. Like, WWE and wrestling logic is terrifying. Like, what kind of message does this send to your fans at this time? And you're right. We are 
lamenting this idiotic nature of Lana and Rusev, and yet here we are just completely forgetting this ridiculous faux pas. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the majority of WWE fans of this current modern era probably don't even remember this this stage. They've probably, you know, only been watching for a few years. Bloody millennials. Um, <clears throat> but it is what it is. They, you know, it's such a weird angle. But I enjoyed the match itself, and it, it kind of drew me in, and I, I felt almost dirty for enjoying it, because I was like, ooh, ooh, like the storyline's not good. But the match is so good, actually. For me, it was match of the night from a entertainment and wrestling aspect. Like, there's probably, I mean, there's, you know, you could argue one of the other matches coming up is slightly better from a wrestling standpoint, but I think this drew me in. And these guys did such an admirable job. And even the promo afterwards where she chases him backstage and she's like, and you know, and you said like, Oh, you know, what happens if you got hurt and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, the response to it's really funny. Cause it's just like, Oh, until I can work out what's going on, I need you to stay away from me. And that of course leads to, you know, I believe Lita later down the line, just ending up staying with Kane. And then Gene Snitsky comes along and there's more carny crash nonsense. And I'm sure we'll cover it later on, but yeah, it, it's, this stinks of Vince McMahon. It really does. You know Vince McMahon is sitting there. He's with Pat Patterson, who, with the best one in the world, no offence, but Pat Patterson isn't exactly going to know how to please a woman, is he? That's not really his department. So he sat there with Pat Patterson, and he's going, hmm, you know what, Pat? I reckon women only want babies if they're raped. <laughs> Just that that's Vince McMahon in a nutshell. He's got his hands on this. He's like, he's probably sitting it again. I think this is one of his sick and twisted fantasies. He likes the idea of like forcing women into sex so that he can give them, you know, some demon seed baby. And then we'll have some even bigger man come in and cause a miscarriage. That's money. <laughs> and you could just see everybody so terrified in that creative, not wanting to question Vince McMahon for the sake of their livelihood and their job. But literally every day, I reckon his creative team would go home and weep to their significant others about the horrors that they were forced <laughs> to do. Because it is just horrible that you could honestly think this is acceptable. You know, this wasn't, this would have been really, I mean, to be fair, it's not the only time, is it? We've had the essentially the raping of an undead corpse. We had the date rape angle with Stephanie and Triple H, where it's like, oh, it's okay, though, because she actually loved him, so it doesn't matter that he basically raped us. <laughs> what? That's how they cover their angles here, and that's what they do with this one, too. Oh, Lita falls in love with him anyway and actually cares about him, so it doesn't really matter that he raped her <laughs> in the first place. You know, rape, right? <laughs> you could just see that oh, rape, rape start rape if they end up falling in love. That's that's not how this works, mate. Stop watching fucking Stockholm Syndrome videos, you creepy old man. <laughs> cringeworthy. Absolutely cringeworthy. Still, the show must go on, and after that, you're thinking, God, blimey, I need a bit of an emotional break. Um, not so much, though. <laughs> IC Championship is on the line. Randy Orton defends against Edge. This is the match where you think, oh, these boys are going to go out there and just steal the fucking show. But I'm curious to see what you think of this uh, because it went on for a long fucking time. Yeah, 26 minutes or something. It went on um, and it felt 26 minutes long. I thought it was boring, uh, to be honest. There were some good, you know, chunks of the match if you like there are good exchanges um as you'd expect between two super talented guys but you know like we said before Randy Orton is super smooth without a doubt you know he is technically very gifted his timing is exceptional but his pacing is so slow it's one of those where I could have fallen asleep halfway through the match for 10 minutes woke up and there'd still be a rest hold going on it was a proper Randy special um and, yeah, it wasn't very good. But we get the big moment where Edge wins to go over. He kind of outsmarts Randy, trying to be a cheating heel bastard by exposing the turnbuckle. And it ends up as his downfall, as it always is, when heels expose the turnbuckle. Uh, and Edge gets the win and is your new Intercontinental Champion, setting Randy Orton up for something else, perhaps. <laughs> but... um. 
I yeah, it, I found it really rest holdy and slow, and you know the the wrestling that was in it was you know technically very very good without a doubt, but I just really struggled to keep my attention fixed on it. To be honest, it was a slog of a match to get through. Yeah, um, British fans will remember the rather famous Monday Night Raw from Earl's Court where John Cena and HBK went an hour long. And the reason I bring that up is because the reason they went an hour long is because the other match that was meant to happen that night was Randy Orton versus Edge. Um, So obviously I never got to see that match. And these... At the time, these two were easily my favourite wrestlers. I thought they were incredible. And to this day, I still, you know, especially Edge, I absolutely adore Edge. Love the rated R stuff and everything that, you know, ended up being with the two. You had rated RKO further down the line as well between these two. But this is the match that I thought I wanted more than anything else. And I ended up getting a very different kind of matchup. And a lot of that is down to the fact that Randy Orton, as methodical as he is, is not a explosive worker he's very slow you can tell that he spent so much time with guys like rick flair and triple h and that he modeled his entire career and how he worked on their kind of style because they're very slow they're very methodical there's you know rick flair is probably a little bit better to be fair and obviously you know you gotta give him credit he's one fifty four at this point like you know he's doing very well at his age to wrestle the way he is but Triple H especially, highly regarded as a very competent, excellent worker, but nothing particularly exciting. And that shows in this match. It's not a bad match by any means, but it's so slow. And what it is, is <clears throat> one of the things I really feel about Randy Orton especially, because obviously Edge overall has incredible matches, and this is more an anomaly for him than it is anything else. The reality is that Randy Orton's matches are a symphony of moves that could be put into a 10 minute match that are stretched out. That's what he does. You know, he takes the less is more approach, but drags it out. It's a very strange concept. It's, you know, we're looking at it and we're thinking, okay, I can do this move. This looks good. I can do this. This looks good. You know, bat breaker, uh, net breaker, DDT and all this stuff. What he does is he drags the moves out. So ultimately what you get is a match with too much pacing, too, too slow pacing. And, you know, he's obviously been told, let everything breathe, let everybody feel everything they do. And because of that, he doesn't make mistakes. But ultimately it's too slow. And that's Randy Orton's legacy for me as a wrestler, not necessarily as an entertainer. And have you noticed that if you look back at all of Randy Orton's best matches, his match with The Undertaker, especially the hardcore stuff like when he was inside Hell in a Cell, the match with Mick Foley, of course, which a lot of people would argue is probably his best match. It's no surprise that all of his best matches, he has to break away from that methodical nature. And he has to go to somewhere completely different. And because of that, we see something very special and very unique from Randy Orton. But that's ultimately Randy Orton's legacy for me. You know, we saw it at Mania 31. Do you remember when he beat Seth Rollins? And he gave him that incredible RKO where he kind of leapt up off of his shoulders. Um, He went for the curb stop and he launched him up in the air and caught him on the way down with an RKO. That, for me, sums up Randy Orton's entire career. You know, we got, (laughs) you have to wait so long just to see the one great thing from Randy Orton. And yeah, all of Randy Orton's great matches are against people that are unorthodox. I don't remember Randy Orton against, you know, remember him versus John Cena for the 50th time on pay-per-view. And every single time it was boring because both guys were methodical and slow and didn't do anything particularly outside the box unless they were forced to. And this is a fine example of that. Edge ultimately goes over, like you say. It's, It's a good match for what it is. But it's one of those things where I thought if you took all the content from 26 minutes and put it in 10 or 15 minutes, it would have been world class. It would have been four or five stars. But because of the timing and the pacing and the distancing, also the crowd were very interesting. They spent a lot of time behind Orton, um, which was very, I'm very curious about that because it's not like they're in Kansas City, Missouri. I know they're in Connecticut, but Connecticut's not really regarded as a smart town. It's more the home of WWE. But fans seem to be very much against uh, Edge as a whole, from what I could tell. I don't know if that's because they felt he was being forced down the throat a bit, or maybe just because Randy Orton was the shining star at this point and people were just getting behind him. But yeah, ultimately, um, 
it's not disappointing, but it's not what I wanted. And I gave it three, maybe a very big push, three and a half stars. But I think the pacing was just too much of an issue for me. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. The Randy's, Randy's exciting during the kind of legend killer period, as you say, when he was in there with the Undertaker. He's able to produce incredible moments in matches. The RKO is you know, cliched now, really, has been you know the out of nowhere, out of nothing finishing move. But actually, you know, in the early part of his career, that was or well, oh, the early part of him using it, should I say? That was so exciting and so different. You know, there wasn't a case of, okay, we know there's going to be four, five, six set moves building up to the RKO, which is kind of what it did become for a while when he went through that really stale phase where he was just winning loads of titles and it was hot potatoing around. But has Randy ever been exciting to, to watch in a match? I think he's been involved in some really good rivalries and he's had a couple of, as you say, been involved in a couple of really great matches. But it's more the fact that he just gives you some really good moments, which are great for gifts. And um, that makes us think that actually he's better than he is. He's very flattered by the number of titles that he's won when you actually look at the quality of matches that he has. And it's not the fact that he's a bad wrestler. As you say, it's just the pacing. It's, it's far too slow to really be exciting. And although he's good at making it look as if he's being very intense and brooding with everything that he's doing and he's calculated and, you know, when he's in heel mode particularly, he is very good at that. It's so slow that you just it takes you out of the match. It's almost like that's become a gimmick for him now. How slow can I actually make this match? And then we'll just do a really quick power slam and then we're going to slow it down for another five minutes. It's, ugh. He's he's bored me for a long, long time. Yeah, the um, I suppose the defence would be that his style means that he limits injuries. And Randy Orton's the kind of person who can live a healthy lifestyle with his. You know, he's got a lot of children as well, documented, and he's a bit more of a family man, a bit more settled down now. Um, you know, a lot of people would argue, in many ways. Uh, in the way that The Miz was the same kind of worker as well for such a long time. I think The Miz, though, has kind of certainly improved his style, made it a bit quicker, and also something about The Miz was his wild charisma that kind of set him apart from Randy Orton. But I suppose his, you know, his defenders would argue that this is the kind of style that you know keeps you well protected and stops you from getting massive injuries, and that's a good thing. But ultimately, it means that his legacy as a wrestler is one of a slow-paced, pretty boring wrestler that, like you say, would provide moments. And ultimately, he feels more like a gif or a meme now, doesn't he? The, the RKO out of nowhere is just kind of used as a comical device almost. You know, There was a period a couple of years ago where he was just randomly appearing out of the crowd and RKOing people for no reason, even if he wasn't wrestling them. It was a very strange thing to do and yeah like you say he's also flattered by an astonishing amount of titles but that's probably what's going to happen when he trips boy let's be honest he was very smart and he aligned himself with the right people and if you look back at documentaries of wrestling Triple H's DVD uh, on Randy Orton he even says on Randy Orton's DVD uh, that you know Randy Orton had a bad reputation at certain points with, you know, he was a bit out of control with drugs and alcohol and things, but I never saw any of that. And it's a case of Triple H has always been, you know, very keen on Randy Orton. And for whatever reason, that means that he's probably going to get the benefit of a rub far more often than other guys in that company. So it is what it is. You know, politics are very much an important thing in wrestling. And ultimately, Randy Orton has played the game probably better than anybody else especially in recent memory yeah. um, other than possibly John Cena uh, for the number one contendership of the women's championship uh, we have Victoria versus Molly Holly a rematch almost from Wrestlemania uh, neither woman is champion at this point I believe Trish Stratus is champion however Trish Stratus uh, was injured at this time only a minor injury I believe which is why she couldn't compete and that's why she was in the corner of Tyson Tonka truck <laughs> as uh, he defeated Val Venus in a lean two and a half minutes. Val Venus was accompanied by Nidia. That was on Sunday night heat. What a match. 
Tonka Truck versus Val Venus. Wowzers. Uh, how things have changed. So, yeah, uh, Trish Stratus can't wrestle. However, who will face her for the WWE Women's Championship, Victoria or Molly Holly? Molly Holly rather hilariously has her wig on, doesn't she? All strapped on. And do you know what? This reminded me very much of their WrestleMania match. Uh, not very long but ultimately deserve to be on the card. Two women who work really well. And I'll tell you one thing I've really realised from watching this era is how much I loved Victoria. Incredible worker, great look, actually very charismatic at times, and ultimately is a real, real massive important cog in the working unit that was women's wrestling of the time. Oh, definitely. Um, Molly Holly was absolutely pivotal and, and Victoria as well to the fact that we were actually getting to watch decent uh, decent women's wrestling at times even if it was for very short amounts of time again this is another sort of five minute um, five minute match which although it has consequence it's positioned before the main event it is literally positioned as the piss break match you know that's where Vince puts it that's where he sees women's wrestling but they actually go out there and put on a very good match because they are probably at this point, other than uh, maybe Gail Kim, the two best uh, women's wrestlers in the company. Um, they're they're both excellent. So yeah, I thought it was a I thought it was a decent match, but again, it just doesn't really go long enough. And again, it's more about fucking Jerry Lawler being a twat on commentary, and it's more about the. <sighs> You know, the the wig gimmick just overshadowing a lot else that was going on, um, which is a shame. And how hard they had to work against adversity. And when you think, you know, it's not a million years ago. We're talking about, you know, 15, 16 years ago, this was happening. You know, we're not talking this happening in the 1960s. Women not getting, you know, women not getting an opportunity. They can't be given an opportunity. They're there to clean the house. Like that, that's that literally voice. what <laughs> that's what they were being given to do in 2004 in your ruthless aggression era where so much changed for the better um, it wasn't about the talent it was purely about Vince being a complete and utter twat and a chauvinist and again this is another example of it but I thought in the time they were given I thought they did a very good job yeah, it's so admirable is the work rate of both of these women. I love Molly Holly. She comes across as the most likable of women of any era. She's just, you know, we, we talk so often about different stories that have come by, the fact that she helped Beth Phoenix so much. You know, she offered to, she paid for Beth Phoenix's tuition as a wrestler up front because she believed in her so much. You know, she's that kind of woman. She's given more back to women's wrestling than anyone realises. And it does anger me. It does want me up when you go on social media and you see this very revision and revisionist history and nature of our modern day wrestling modern day wrestling fans are a bit of a joke i'm sorry but they are and the reason for that is because they just conveniently forget a lot of history you know i'm seeing 14 15 year old girls on twitter giving it all that about china and the bellas and aj lee and i'm thinking you know they just conveniently forget so many of these people you know the history is written in what suits them and ultimately for me molly holly has so such an important and crucial part of the women's wrestling legacy under her belt. And a lot of people don't seem to realise that. And the same goes for Victoria. But you know, like you say, it's it's six and a half minutes, but both women go out there and do an admirable job and you know make sure that they do their job properly. And I really respect that and I love that. And although it's a throwaway match that nobody remembers from this pay-per-view, I choose to remember these women far more fondly than I do a lot of other wrestlers on this card. You know, I'm certainly going to think more of Molly, Holly and Victoria in the long run than I am Rhino and Tajiri versus Jonathan Coachman. <laughs> it's just the reality of the situation. So it is what it is. Um, that leaves one more match for the World Heavyweight Championship. Don't let the network fool you. Did you see the network? They're brilliant. They're so good at trying to cover the Vanna Chris Benoit. It doesn't exist. Triple H Challengers for the WWE Championship. No, he fucking doesn't. I'm on to you, cretins. Uh, yeah, for the World Heavyweight Championship, Chris Benoit versus Trips. Because we haven't seen that before. <laughs> 
I just I could just see it now. Triple H just wetting his proverbial pants at the opportunity to be in the main event once again. Even in the promo, it smelt of Triple H, didn't it? Oh yeah, uh, now it's just it's me and you, Chris. It was pretty much no talking from Benoit <laughs> in the promo, other than yeah. just prove me wrong at the very what? end. It's like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be proving. You haven't spoken. You haven't said anything, you Canadian cunt. I'll tell you why that is, because rather cleverly, uh, for those of us who know, Chris Benoit's voice has been edited right down to the bare minimum uh, to ensure not hear his voice this was part of the network administration thing where they said that they were going to basically edit a lot of things to try and ensure that chris benoit is not seen as much the visibility is much lower you might have noticed as well in bookmarks and things they would skip out his matches so that he basically you know they, yeah. they're just basically trying to write him out of history understandably so but yeah that's that's what they did so yeah, Chris Benoit defends his World Heavyweight Championship against Triple H in an OK match that is more storyline based than it is wrestling. And that is a problem when Chris Benoit is your champion. Because Chris Benoit is not exactly, shall we say, teeming with charisma, is he really? So, yeah, um, this match hinges on the fact that is Eugene going to do the right thing or is he going to help or whatever? And ultimately, yeah, Eugene gets involved and yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, Eugene gets involved. Uh, Benoit gets the win. Eugene doesn't really pick a side. So they can keep this storyline going, thank God. Keep it alive. It's red hot. Whoopee! Uh, it's, um... And, of course, you know, if Triple H is going to lose, there's got to be two low blows. There's got to be multiple chair shots. Uh, you know, ref bumps. The involvement of... Uh, Eugene, it's they it can't just be right. Well, you know, Chris Benoit's one of the best wrestlers in the world, and he managed to out wrestle Triple H and defeat him on pay per view. He is the champion. Let's put the champion over and make the champion look strong. Fuck you. What we need down here is uh, someone with mental deficiencies. We need an unconscious referee. We need weapons, and we need dick shots. Lots of dick shots. It was just. And the thing was that, I mean, Benoit's the babyface in this scenario, but he's, you know, liberally trying to use the chair and do low blows. Now, Rock and Austin could get away with that as babyfaces because they were so super over and they were the anti-hero uh, characters. But Benoit isn't really supposed to be an anti-hero character, so it actually doesn't really fit with him. He's just, you know, he's intense and he's competitive. And him just locking in the crossface and just shouting at Eugene to wake up the wrath, wake up the wrath, wake up the wrath. <laughs> it's just this fucking shit. It was really, it was the Eugene involvement was so dragged out and it, it just seemed to go on forever. And it's like, I actually just, Ben Watt, just fucking knock him out, knock him out, put him outside. Or Triple H knock him out and put him outside, I suppose, as Triple H is the heel. And then have Benoit, you know, smack him down into the crossface and and tap him out. That would have been a better end to the match than what we got. I see, the match was fine. I thought it was a, a decent match. Other than the fact that Triple H looked far too dominant in the match for my liking. I thought he was, you know, got to keep him looking strong. Why? He's not the champion. Shut your mouth, Triple H. That's to look strong at all times. They could have had Benoit out-wrestling him and dominating him, but no, Triple H is the dominant one. And on commentary, they're putting over how he's out-wrestled Benoit, and obviously that's not feasibly true. So it, it's okay, it's fine, it's a good match. It's a middle-of-the-road affair, nothing particularly special. A little bit underwhelming, and just for me, the Eugene involvement ruins it a bit mostly because it went on too long. And again, Eugene's facials and his selling of it and all that stuff is very good in what he's being asked to do. He's doing it well. But ultimately, it's really not. It's just not necessary. And it just went on for far too long. Far too long. 
yeah, like you say, once again, like Nick Dinsmore actually does quite an admirable job of getting involved and, you know, sort of just, I, yeah, I actually thought that, like, you know, from what he was asked to do, he was quite good. And I thought, well, oh, this is not that bad, actually. Like, you know, it's definitely got its place. It kind of belongs where it does. But, yeah, like... Let you say, just dragged on, and the idea that Triple H goes out there and dominates such a massive portion of the match. I get that he's the heel, but he doesn't even like nefariously take over, like by getting a low blow in or something. He just outworks Chris Benoit. And like you said, that's not feasible. And do you know what I've realised? Chris Benoit's run as world champion is actually a bit shit. It's actually not that good, and ultimately, you know that's not necessarily his fault. I think the rematch. For the, uh, the Triple Threat rematch, I thought it was fantastic. I know you weren't as hot on it. I thought that was definitely his best match. I think his match with Kane was a bit meh. It was all right. Like, you know, Kane worked hard, but ultimately, who gives a shit? And, yeah, I just, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, like, you know, people romanticize about Chris Benoit as the world heavyweight champion, but it is really just that one moment. And without that, nobody gives a shit. <laughs> like, you know, like... People, if you ask people, like all these people who go crazy about how great Chris Benoit was and, oh, Chris Benoit should be in the Hall of Fame and all this utter nonsense, which is, you know, it is nonsense. I bet they can't tell you any of these matches. I bet they don't know that he wrestled Triple H Avengers. I bet they don't know that he had a rematch for that Triple Threat. I bet they don't fucking know about the match with Kane. Because as far as they're concerned, you know, it started with this magical win at WrestleMania and ended with this magical loss to, you know, so-and-so or whoever, spoiler alert, I guess, uh, at SummerSlam. So, you know, it, but I'm looking back at this and I'm thinking, a lot of these matches, they're not fantastic. He was never put up against great wrestlers. Like, for me, he would have been far better off taking on Shawn Michaels in the singles match. You know, he would have been far better off. But the problem was, as well, that all the good technical wrestlers were fucking ev elsewhere. You know, Shelton Benjamin is great, but he's not charismatic really enough to face the world champion. Charlie Haas is technical, but he's got the charisma of a vacuum. Um... You know, where's Kurt Angle at this point? He's injured, so he's fucked. Eddie Guerrero's on SmackDown as well. So Chris Benoit is left on a brand which is all about sports entertainment. And Chris Benoit is not a sports entertainer. Chris Benoit is a wrestler. You know, there's the big distinction. When people sort of... I, I hear this a lot. People say, oh, Daniel Bryan is the Chris Benoit of the modern era. No, he's not. He's actually a lot better. And that's going to hurt a lot of people to say so. But Daniel Bryan is so much better as an all-round wrestler and entertainer. Like, he just is. Like, Chris Benoit, he flatters to deceive a lot of the time. And he is world-class technical wrestler. But ultimately, world-class technical wrestlers with no charisma, with no ability to sports entertain, shouldn't be champion. And that's kind of what I get from this legacy. And you could see why, in the modern era that Vince McMahon is very reluctant. Have you noticed? We don't really get good wrestling champions anymore, do we? We don't get, like, a just a great wrestling champion. And there's a reason for that, because ultimately, they're not actually that good. They're not. They can't entertain on the same level. And Chris Benoit was the proving ground for this. Chris Benoit was the best sports entertainment wrestler you could ask for. Um, the best, sorry, athletic wrestler. And you know what? He couldn't cut the mustard as a sports entertainer. He couldn't. And he was in the ring with Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Kane, Randy Orton, guys who were good sports entertainers. And he never really delivered anything special. And ultimately, that's what I remember from his legacy. And that kind of is the exclamation point for this pay-per-view for me. Chris Benoit retains the title because of bullshit shenanigans involving Eugene. And it just went on and on and on. And, yeah, they're milking the Eugene thing for all it's worth. And, yeah, it it stinks a little bit, to be honest. And, as, you know, like you say, match is fine. A little bit long, but it's fine. But ultimately, I just, I came away from this match thinking, I am bored and pretty much done now of seeing Chris Benoit as the heavyweight champion. Move on, please. Yeah, he's been booked pretty poorly. I mean, I actually thought that the Kane match was actually probably a bit better and a bit more kind of exciting than this match of Triple H, which is silly to say, really, from a wrestling perspective. Um, but I actually thought at least there was a dynamic of, you know, 
giant monster versus small, tough, gritty kind of guy and chopping him down. There was a better story, an obvious one, but a better story to be told. So I thought they did a better job with. I agree putting him in there with Shawn Michaels would have been good, but obviously they put Triple H over Shawn Michaels in their rivalry. So that was never going to happen. For me, it should have been Chris Jericho in this position. Um, mm. That would have been my pick. And obviously we go on and we get to see, you know, other guys going in there and getting opportunities at the title. But they should have, I think, you could have had a great two or three matches, you know, uh, sort of pay-per-view matches, a pay-per-view trilogy, a bit like what we had with Shawn Michaels and Triple H. But have it with Jericho and Eddie Guerrero for the title and just have great wrestling at the top of the card for your championship. Um, because Jericho's then got the charisma and the sports entertainment stuff as well as the brilliant wrestling to be able to put that rivalry over. He's already got the, you know, uh, credibility and, you know, he's been champion before at this point. Obviously the first ever undisputed champion and all that. That's what I would have had going on personally. I, I don't know why they insisted on sticking with the Triple H and Shawn Michaels inserted in there. And if it's not going to be one of them two, we've got to go to the other primary sports entertainment guy that we have that we can throw into any scenario and fans will just buy it in Kane. Like, that was Kane's job. Like, we put him in. He's just got a job out to put over a guy who's coming back from injury. Yeah, that's fine. Need to put him in to job out, you know, to, you know, put over the champion. Yeah, we can do that a month later. Fans will buy it. We need to put him in to put, you know into a monstrous, you know, he's really, really evil and demonic and, you know, he's a rapist angle. Yeah, fine, fans will buy it. You know, it's Kane was just the guy who could be put anywhere and would do a job and fans would be like, yeah, that's totally believable. Um, and guys benefited from working with him. You know, it's not a slight on Kane at all. As I say, I, I thought his, his match with Benoit was probably better than this Triple H match. I just feel that Benoit was booked quite poorly and wasn't booked in a way that could play to his strengths. They're so insistent on being a sports entertainment company, even at this point, that they're not willing to say, OK, we've put the title on a wrestler. Now let's showcase why he's the champion by letting him go out there and have the best possible wrestling matches with the best possible wrestling opponents. As he said, why didn't we get Shawn Michaels Benoit one on one on pay-per-view? for the title why did it have to have Triple H inserted in there as a triple threat it's those things that piss me off it's those things that irritate me um, so I, yeah I mean it's I don't think Benoit did a particularly good job on the fact that he didn't have enough charisma to really carry the title in the way that WWE needs but he wasn't put in a position where he could you know play to his strengths I thought the booking around him was very poor. And again, it doesn't help having Eugene around as his biggest fucking ally. Do you know? <laughs> it's just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. The, the Benoit title run has been very, very underwhelming. Very underwhelming. And history remembers it more fondly than it probably deserves to. We remember it fondly because of the WrestleMania moment. But the actual title run that followed it was pretty anticlimactic. And a lot of that, you have to come back and blame the villain of 2004, Triple H. Yeah, Triple H's um, signature is all over this. And people have, again, with the revisionist history, people think of Triple H. Ah, oh, he started NXT. Triple H will save us from Vince McMahon. Triple H spent many years making this product dog shit with his own ego, with his, you know, insistence on being the guy or being in the title runs or whatever it may be. And you know what? Do you know, I just, I'm not one of these people who believes that Triple H is the saviour and be-all and end-all of said product. Like, yeah, he has done an absolutely amazing job with NXT. But, you know, at the same time, we shouldn't forget the legacies that come with it. And the legacy is that Triple H for a long time ruined this product by insistently being the guy on top or being in the position. Like, like we spoke at the last Raw pay-per-view, the World Heavyweight Champion is the curtain jerker for the main event. He's a penultimate match so that we can watch Triple H and Shawn Michaels go over each other for 47 minutes. Like, fuck you. I don't want to see all that. And, you know, it... 
it's funny, isn't it? Because all people ever do is shit on me. Oh, Roman Reigns forced down my neck. Oh, fucking Seth Rollins forced down my neck. Well, this isn't the first case of that. This has been the case ever since Triple H got his grubby mitts in on things. And, you know, being married to the... I know it's such an old cliched argument, but being married to the boss's daughter and obviously putting in the work that he did backstage and being in all those meetings and stuff like that. Yeah, you could say he certainly earned a large amount of that position, but he also denigrated a lot of the product by being in that position because of his insistence on always being there or being on top. And that hurt the product. He couldn't get out of the way in his ego, and obviously wrestling as a whole proves this, that his ego wouldn't get out of the way and allow him to let other people get over and look good in that spot. And that's ultimately why, when it comes down to it, that the only people we really remember other than him out of this era are probably, what, Edge, Eddie, um, you know, and John Cena, because obviously Chris Jericho was obviously pretty much established at this point. So, yeah, there's a distinct lack of stars in the current product, and there's a distinct lack of stars at this point, simply because, even though there's star power, obviously, in retrospect, Triple H's ego wouldn't allow him to get the fuck out of the way. And, yeah, that's another raw pay-per-view, where ultimately I feel like I got way too much Triple H, way too much evolution, way too much bollocks, and the matches that were good, really, other than Kane and Matt Hardy, weren't as good as advertised, and that's a really big disappointment for this pay-per-view. So it's certainly not nearly as terrible as the last two shows we covered, but for me, overall, this show is two, two and a half out of five at best. Um, the main event, I gave it three. I thought it was okay. It was all right, but I'm not going to remember it, you know, in the long term. It's not a classic by any means, but it's a good, solid match. Um, yeah, so ultimately, two, two and a half for WWE Vengeance 2004. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. It's not uh, the other shows that we did, like the Smack the, the the American Bash SmackDown show that we just did, was genuinely awful. But that made it funny. It was so bad that it was hilarious, and you couldn't help but just laugh at the nonsense that was going on. This was fine. It was just a bit boring and a bit slow and a bit. Oh, why is Eugene out here? And it was just very meh. And as you say, it wasn't memorable. I don't think that, you know, right now, there is anyone who's sitting there talking about, do you remember this classic moment from Vengeance 2004? It didn't provide us with anything like that. So I think this was just, a, I completely agree, a completely middle-of-the-road WWE pay-per-view. And suffering from the fact, I think, that we had three pay-per-views in five weeks, I think, of this period of 2004, they were just hammering pay-per-views in uh, completely unnecessarily, just wedging them in. If we can fit another one in there, fuck them. Uh, but at least now we've got the build to SummerSlam. Uh, SummerSlam 2004. And of course, that is always, as one of the big four pay-per-views, SummerSlam always delivers. It's one of my favourite pay-per-views, actually, because SummerSlam normally provides us with some really good wrestling. Uh, and better wrestling than you get at WrestleMania. WrestleMania is a spectacle. Royal Rumble's just about the Royal Rumble match. Uh, you know, Survivor Series obviously had its gimmicky, you know, Survivor Series matches. SummerSlam was the good wrestling pay-per-view historically. So I'm looking forward to, to kind of reliving what SummerSlam 2004 gave us. Yeah, even in the old eras, uh, if you look back, SummerSlam always kind of outdid uh, WrestleMania for a entertainment and wrestling standpoint. You know, there's going to be... I mean, I remember the SummerSlam card for 2004. It's actually a fairly decent one in retrospect. They got their shit in order. And like you say, I think one of the biggest problems here is there's just too many shows. Three in five weeks. Three babies in five That's obscene. And this was kind of the problem when they did the brand sp- it recently wasn't it when they had these brand previews and they were doing it again about two or three years ago they fell back into this kind of trap of you know not doing the whole less is more moniker and look at all of wwe now look at what's most successful 
NXT, for instance, their season one, was it four takeovers a year? You know, AEW, for all of the things that people can critique it for, one thing that's great about it is the limited amount of main event shows that you get. Less really is more. And at this point in time, WWE was just out of control. <laughs> just like, have everything. Pay-per-views every other week. Didn't work. It really watered down the product. And their roster was too thin to cover this. So, and especially because Vince McMahon and Stephanie McMahon, who I know was in charge of creative on Raw, she basically just pilfered all of the main talent. And of course, you know, who's going to say no to the boss's daughter, and especially with Triple H on that card as well? They had no chance, SmackDown, really. And that's why SmackDown was so fucking dreadful. And this is a SmackDown, by the way, that had John Cena, Kurt Angle, and The Undertaker. So that tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> um, that tells you everything you need to know. Undercard and mid card are very important. And so far, there are two things I've taken from this legacy. One, of course, is what I've mentioned about Chris Benoit, and the other one is the fact that the undercard and midcard fucking dreadful really 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 bad you know Mordecai Bob Holly Billy Gunn <laughs> Tadgers he's great but he's far past his prime at this point Rhino Garrison Cade La Resistance no tag team division to speak of Randy Orton did a great job as a midcard champion he was probably the best midcard champion they've had in a long time especially since the Christian and Edge era of you know the end of the alliance and things like that but yeah, ultimately, it all feels a bit lackluster. But like you say, positivity on the horizon because SummerSlam should be an absolute banger. So we're working our way towards that. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. And of course, we will be catching you very soon for more nonsense from this insane year of 2004. Steve Neal, thank you very much for joining me to cover another, well, not a banger, but at least a show from 2004. <laughs> A show. That's exactly how they should a have party promoted it. WWE presents a show. <laughs> it's, it's not a panel. Uh, it's party popper. It's it's silly string at best. It is absolutely silly string. Yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a pleasure, mate. It's um, fun actually going back through even the ones that are terrible. At least it's funny just taking the piss out of them afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, it also gives us something to do with our free time. And if nothing else, hopefully you guys listening and getting a certain level of entertainment. I know that people are enjoying them. I know that we're getting decent downloads on them. So thank you very much for continuing to stay with us and put up with this nonsense here. And ultimately, we hope you're enjoying, if nothing else, Steve going absolutely ballistic and making some fantastic little memories, calling things fetal anomaly. So if nothing else, you're getting gold from Steve Neal. And I'm sure he will be the first to point out that you're fucking welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah uh, from myself and Steve Neal thank you very much for listening to Manic Mondays we will be back of course with the next offering for 2004 as we rampage towards the end of this arc and of course ladies and gentlemen as I always say if you've got any ideas on what you want us to cover next make sure you get in contact with us send us a message but until then take it easy and we'll catch you very soon for more nonsense from Manic Mondays <laughs>